all the COVID-19 developments for you over the next hour. But to uh, break up your routine in a way you, you may not like, uh, today that does not include Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's daily pandemic briefings. I realize some of you have timed yourselves to sit here and, and hear that every day. Uh, but the Prime Minister is today headed to uh, CFB Trenton, Ontario, for the repatriation ceremony for those six Canadian military members that were killed last week in the helicopter crash off the coast of Greece. He wants to be there for that, and that uh, will happen uh, later this afternoon. As we look live, our focus will be over the next hour, though, here in the nation's capital anyway. We are expecting our daily uh, pandemic briefing from government officials, cabinet ministers, and public health officials. So we'll bring that to you in lieu of the prime minister today. The House of Commons uh, is also sitting today in person for their COVID committee. Uh, some of them will be physically uh, there, not in that building, but right beside it in the West Block, of course, where they're now doing their work. Uh, so we'll carry some of that too through uh, the afternoon as we monitor uh, the questions and answers. Of course, the Prime Minister not going to be at that session either because he is on his way to CFB Trenton. And speaking of that, let's go to southeastern Ontario and the Canadian Forces Base, where CBC's Jacqueline Hansen is, and she'll be there throughout this afternoon's repatriation ceremony to honour those six Canadians killed in that helicopter crash uh, just almost a week ago, a little more than a week ago. Uh, Jacqueline, what, what are we expecting in terms of how the day will unfold? So, uh, Rosie, it's expected that the plane that we are waiting for will land just before 2 o'clock Eastern time, and that will be on the tarmac on the base that's just behind me. We're off the base right now. You can tell there's quite a bit of traffic around if you catch some of that noise on the microphone here. But otherwise, a very quiet area at this point. Um, and the uh, Department of National Defense is encouraging people to stay home and uh, not come out to uh, watch the ceremony. This is quite a different ceremony ceremony than in the past. Um, in keeping with, you're talking about physical distancing, uh, that will be uh, the name of the day here as well. Um, anyone who is on the tarmac of the Canadian Armed Forces, they will be required to be physical distancing, though there is one exception. So after the plane lands here, uh, the casket of Sub-Lieutenant Abigail Cobra will be uh, taken off of the plane by pallbearers. Those people, those pallbearers, bearers will need to be a bit closer together in order to carry that off. They will have gloves on. Um, we're also told that we'll be seeing some non-medical masks on the Canadian Armed Forces members who are taking part in the ceremony today. But we can expect to see that casket come off the plane, followed by five other people. And each of those people will be carrying a pillow with a hat on top. That is the official headdress of each of the other um, members who were killed in that helicopter crash a week ago. Um, so because we know that the only body that was recovered from the crash was of cobras, so the other are in place of, of caskets today. Uh, Rosie, and, and those mementos, the casket, and as well as the pillows, those will be taken into to a separate hearse each, and each of those will be part of a motorcade that will go down the Highway of Heroes towards Toronto. So the whole thing is expected to take about an hour and a half this afternoon here and then into Toronto. That's right, and and the Premier saying the same thing as, as you said there off the top, that even if you'd like to be along the Highway of Heroes, it's not a good idea given uh, what we're dealing with. Will, will there be, fa along with the Prime Minister, will there also be family and other people who will be in attendance in some way uh, given the, the parameters that they have to deal with? Yes, yeah, so as soon as the plane lands here, they will uh, bring out family members as well as those VIP guests, which would include the Prime Minister. And family members were able to be here today because the military uh, sent a plane to pick them up. We know that commercial travel is incredibly limited right now as Canadians are encouraged to stay home and, and, and not to travel. Um, and, you know, it is an interesting um, occurrence that we're having today because so many Canadians have lost family members and loved ones over recent weeks to COVID-19 and, and for other reasons, but um, they haven't been able to celebrate those lives, commemorate those lives in a traditional sense. And so um, we'll be seeing this ceremony today, but not 
the typical repatriation ceremony that we have seen in the past. Like you mentioned, um, when Canadians would locally come out and, and line the Highway of Heroes to stand and honour those members who were killed, that you know, they're being encouraged not to do that, to stay home, watch it on television or watch it online to try to find that alternative way to engage in and, and to honour those lives lost if they, if they choose to do so. Okay. Jacqueline Hansen at CFB Trenton, where she will be through the day. Thank you very much for that, Jacqueline. Appreciate it. I'll just remind you at this time that CBC News Network will, of course, have special coverage of that repatriation for those six Canadian Forces members. Uh, as Jacqueline says, the flight lands later this afternoon at CFB Trenton, and our news special will begin at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'd also just remind you that at this hour, uh, we don't know what caused the crash. The data recorders are back here in the nation's capital for examination. But as our Murray Brewster reported earlier, this week, we do now know that the chopper was making its way back uh, to HMCS Fredericton and that there were a number of their colleagues who, who witnessed the crash. All right, I, I'm going to take you now to our uh, briefing from public health officials here. Here's the president of the Treasury Board, Jean-Yves Duclos, who is also the co-chair of the COVID Cabinet Committee. Let's listen in live. Impacted by this tragedy. Nous accompagnons les familles des victimes. We are with the victims' families in their grief and profound sadness. From British Columbia to Newfoundland and Labrador, people are grieving for the loss of their loved ones. We will continue to be there for the friends and families and loved ones during these difficult times, and we will continue to provide them with all the required support. Today, I am accompanied by Dr. Tam and Dr. Nu, who will begin by providing you with an update in public health statistics. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll start with the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 62,458 confirmed cases, including 4,111 deaths. Over 27,000, um, or 43 percent, of cases have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 970,000 people for COVID-19 to date with about 6 percent of these testing positive overall. This is Mental Health Week, which began on Monday and continues through to Sunday, May the 10th. This year, mental health takes on a special meaning in light of the additional stress and uncertainty that we are all experiencing due to COVID-19. Across Canada and around the world, people have been struggling with concerns of all manner and scope during these long weeks. Fitting the theme for this year is social connection. We've said many times leading up to this week that while we're apart physically, there has never been a more important time to stay connected. Canadians have shown resilience, finding creative ways to remain connected virtually, while keeping close relationships with family, friends and communities, even during holidays and important religious observances. But this doesn't mean our new ways of connecting have been ideal or without added stress. In recognition of the many challenges that we're facing, the Canadian Mental Health Association is leading the way on Mental Health Week by encouraging us to get real with our feelings. These mental health experts remind us that for the sake of our mental wellness, we shouldn't bury or hide our emotions. So as we move forward into the uncertain days ahead, let's not forget that we're on this road together and there is help. Don't be afraid to speak up and talk if you are struggling with the weight of what you're feeling. Talking things out can help you, and it can also help others who may be finding it more difficult to voice their own struggles. We might still be apart physically, but by talking about how you're feeling, you'll find you're not alone. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Tam. Dr. Nou? Merci. Bon après-midi. Thank you. Good afternoon. As usual, I will begin with the, the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 62,468 confirmed cases, including 4,111 deaths and over 27,000 now recovered. 
Labs across Canada have tested over 970,000 people for COVID-19 to date, with about 6% of these testing positive. This is Mental Health Week, which began on Monday and continues through to Sunday, May 10th. This year, mental health takes on a special meaning in light of the additional stress and uncertainty we are all experiencing due to COVID-19. Across Canada and around the world, people have been struggling with concerns of all manner and scope during these long weeks. Fittingly, the theme for this year is social connection. We've said many times leading up to this week that while we're apart physically, there has never been a more important time to stay connected. Canadians have shown resilience, finding creative ways to remain connected virtually while keeping close relationships with family, friends and communities, even during holidays and important religious observances. But this doesn't mean our new ways of connecting have been ideal or without added stress. In recognition of the many challenges we're facing, the Canadian Mental Health Association is leading the way on Mental Health Week by encouraging us to hashtag get real with our feelings. These mental health experts remind us that for the sake of our mental wellness, we shouldn't bury or hide our emotions. So, as we move forward into the uncertain days ahead, let's not forget that we're on this road together. And there is help. Don't be afraid to speak up and talk if you are struggling with the weight of what you're feeling. Talking things out can help you, and it can also help others who may be finding it more difficult to voice their own struggles. We might still be apart physically, but by talking about how you're feeling, you'll find you are not alone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. New. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide you with a quick update on the Canadian Armed Forces activities, both in Quebec and in Ontario. The Canadian Armed Forces have 670, uh, 660 uh, members that are supporting care staff in 13 long-term care facilities. Most of them are either in Montreal or in the Greater Montreal region. The Canadian government is working very hard with the Quebec government to deploy more troops into at least seven more long-term care facilities. Canadian Armed Forces are also working night and day for this deployment to take place as quickly as possible. So far, there should be approximately 1,000 members of the uh, armed forces when the deployment will be done. Armed forces is following the um, the guidance of the Ontarian government. They are working very collaboratively to make sure that the the five long-term care centres that were identified are uh, provided with a bit appropriate support from the Canadian Armed Forces always under the leadership and the guidance of the Ontario government. I will also want to take advantage of this opportunity to provide very brief updates on a few of the key um, programs that we have put into place to support workers, families and small businesses in particular in the last few weeks. Uh, a total of 545,000 businesses have received a, an emergency loan up to $40,000 through the Canadian emergency business account as of May 5th. In terms of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the total of 7.5 million Canadians have received at least one payment of the benefit, for a total of 10.9 
million applications. 10.7 million of them have been processed already. And finally, regarding the important wage subsidy, emergency wage subsidy program, uh, as of uh, yesterday, 110,000 businesses have submitted their request for reimbursement of these emergency wage subsidies. The information can, in, all, in most cases, be found on the part of businesses on their account, my account at the Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency. The majority of these business businesses have seen their applications processed by the Canada Revenue Agency, and many of them will receive their payment, their, reimburs their reimbursement of the Canada wage subsidies by tomorrow. Alors, ça nous permet uh, de passer à la période. So that uh, brings us to uh, the questions. Thank you, Minister. As usual, we'll begin with questions on the phone. One question, one follow-up, Operator. Merci. Operator, thank you. If you have a question, appuyez sur étoile maintenant pour poser une question. Notre première question vient de. Our first question comes from Raymond Fillon, TVA. Please go ahead. Question. I have a question for Minister Duclos to come back to the issue of the Canadian Armed Forces members. François Duclos yesterday was saying during his press conference that it was taking too long. Why is it taking so long to deploy 1,000 uh, troops that they asked for two weeks ago? Answer. Thank you for the question. Of course, we know this is a collaborative uh, exercise, and it's very close collaboration between the Quebec government, which, of course, is responsible and, and has jurisdiction over managing the long-term care institutions and the Canadian Armed Forces. As I was saying a few moments ago, there are over 750 members of the Canadian Armed Forces that have already been deployed to support 13 long-term care facilities. We know that there will be an additional deployment of for five other long-term care establishments, and overall we expect there to be about 1,000 members of the Canadian Armed Forces who will very soon be deployed for a total of, added in a total of 20 long-term care facilities. Follow-up question? Question. So 1,000 on the ground. Uh, the Prime Minister talked about uh, a more, more support for seniors. Will that be coming uh, this week? Answer. Well, as to when, of course, the Canadian Armed Forces must work uh, in collaboration uh, with and under the leadership of the Quebec government, one of the e extremely important issues that the Quebec government discussed with the Canadian Armed Forces was the support that had to take place in a context to reassure not only uh, to protect not only their only health and safety, but of course to protect the health and safety of the staff that's already on site and the uh, people who are being taken care of there. We know how important it is that these collaborative processes, when new staff comes in, that things must be done correctly. It requires training and integration and coordination. In response to your question on seniors, we were very clear. The Prime Minister reminded us several times that and we understand that it's very difficult for millions of seniors in Canada and, and in Quebec in particular. And an announcement will soon be made because it is important to support our seniors in the difficult circumstances they find themselves in. Merci, Monsieur Ministre. Thank you, Minister. Next question. Our next question is from Christy Kirka from the Globe and Mail. Have la parole, please go ahead. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much uh, for taking my question. Um, my question is about uh, the recent outbreak in northern Saskatchewan, particularly affecting Indigenous communities there. Um, can you uh, characterize the level of concern about this particular outbreak and uh, what's being done on the ground to try and contain it? Dr. Dan. Yes, thank you for the question. And it is um, an area of concern because it is in uh, a more uh, remote area, but also with um, um, indigenous uh, communities um, in that area. So there's been a lot of collaboration between the province, uh, the local health authorities, the communities, but also um, Indigenous Services Canada. Um, and the agency um, has offered its support wherever uh, it, that's needed. So it is a, a collaborative response. Um, they 
um, as I understand it, uh, local and provincial public health have mobilized um, some significant number of uh, health uh, workers to do door-to-door um, investigation to see if there's any cases to do case finding, uh, contact tracing. So they are really seized with the, um, the issue. And they do have um, sort of on site laboratory testing capabilities, but we're also there to support them if needed. So I think people are taking it extremely seriously because these are uh, vo more vulnerable um, situations. Follow up. Thank you very much. And just as a follow-up on another matter, um, I apologize if my pronunciation is off on this, but I'm wondering if the Public Health Agency of Canada is aware of reports of the uh, Kawasaki-like illness in children in Canada, and if so, where are the cases that the Public Health Agency is, is aware of, and how many cases um, are we talking about? So Kawasaki um, disease or some variants of that syndrome uh, thus is observed on a regular basis um, for children um, after a viral or even bacterial infection. So it's a, a sort of immunologic inflammatory response. So the uh, pediatric networks um, are uh, looking at this. And there have been cases identified, but not necessarily um, found to be uh, ver well, they haven't been verified to be linked to COVID-19 specifically. So those investigations are underway. Um, I believe that there are investigations underway in different areas of Canada, including the biggest provinces, uh, Ontario and Quebec. Thank you, Dr. Operator. Next question, please. Our next question is from Philippe Vincent Foisy, de Radio-Canada. A vous la parole, please go ahead. Hello. My question is for Dr. Tam. I'll ask it in, in French, but you can answer in, in English if you please, or if Dr. New could answer in French, that'd be appreciated too. This morning, we heard that there was not enough testing being done in the country, and therefore it's difficult to correctly assess the, how the, the progression of this pandemic. Do you agree with that statement uh, here in Canada? Answer. This is Dr. New. Thank you for the question. It's not uh, so easy as to answer yes or no to your question when it comes to testing. There are three or four, or perhaps more, aspects to the issue. It's an issue. It's about testing the right people at the right time in the right place. And what does that mean? That means that we must also target people for testing if they have a good chance of being infected with COVID-19. It makes no sense to do random testing of everybody in, in the street because the risk of false positives is higher if we go about it that way. Another thing is that we have to test at the right time because even if someone is contaminated or infected, but it's very early in the incubation period, we may obtain negative results. But three or four or five days later, that same person may have developed symptoms and then more clearly be seen to have contracted COVID-19. And then when it comes to the right place, we know that in some environments such as long-term care facilities, of course, if there's one case in a place like that, then you have to uh, test the staff and the residents to try and identify further cases. So these tests really have to be very targeted according to public health principles and medical principles to perform the right tests uh, with, of the right people at the right time and in the right place. Thank you. Follow-up question. So you're saying that the, uh, that the uh, chief scientist was wrong to say that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Well, what I'm understanding from what you said is that what the uh, chief scientist is saying is that uh, you don't agree with her. Answer, I'm not saying I don't agree. I can't, uh, I have no comments 
as to what other people say. But I think that everyone is on the same path in thinking that it's very, very important to use laboratory tests in the best possible way in order to be as efficient and effective as possible in identifying cases. As I've said before, we must find the right cases and isolate them and treat them properly. And then we also have to do contact tracing following following those preliminary tests. That's good public health policy. And if our interventions are targeted with these goals in mind, things will go well. Thank you, Dr. Annie from CTV. Hi, it's Annie Bertrand Oliver from CTV News. My question is for Dr. Tam and Dr. New. There are still a lot of questions about the degree of community spread and the same with asymptomatic transmission. And now in certain jurisdictions, people are being warned to watch for other symptoms from pink eye to abdominal pains. I'm wondering, one, what you can tell us about Canada's stance on asymptomatic transmission and how concerning that is. And two, until we have firm scientific evidence on the importance of those um, different outbreaks. How can we start reopening schools and the economy? So I think, um, and it may link to the previous question, which is um, that province and territories are um, increasing their testing for people with almost any symptom, so even mild symptoms, um, just because some of the symptoms might be vague and some of the people may be what we call in a sort of really pre-symptomatic and, and or when they only have a few symptoms. So for sure that um, many jurisdictions now are opening up clinics where people with, you know, even mild symptoms um, can get tested. So that is definitely happening. And um, the range of symptoms is quite broad. And so that's part of the strategy to um, look to see if there's any further activities in the community that we haven't, you know, as yet detected with the normal set of symptoms. Um, I think it is extremely important when um, any of the um, reopening plans is that uh, there, in, for every establishment, whether it's a school or workplace, that there is a plan in place for the distancing between people, for all the hygienic measures, and also to, uh, to watch for symptoms. Because if you are actually uh, dealing with a virus, which is actually quite difficult, um, to detect or deal with, those distancing measures and your hand hygiene measures are absolutely fundamental uh, as people are opening up um, businesses, etc. And so I think um, and schools will schedule people so that maybe there's less students in the class and, of course, using the tele, um, telework and tele, um, I guess, schools, uh, learning, uh, remote learning, um, just in order to increase the spacing. So some of those methods will still apply um, for, uh, because of the characteristic of this virus. And we do know, uh, based on more and more information, that uh, this virus uh, can spread in the pre-symptomatic um, and the asymptomatic stage. Okay, now I'm going to be a bit of a pain and do a double-edged question. Sorry about this in advance. Uh, Dr. Tam, your latest projection said that there would be about 3,800 deaths by May 5th. Obviously, now we're up over 4,000. I'm wondering what you can tell us that means about where we are in the outbreak, about the control measures in place, and why our death numbers have gone up. And following to that, Minister Duclos, you know, it looks like deaths are still going up, the number of cases are still going up, and yet right now the CERB is halfway through. Is the government going to extend the CERB? ERB beyond the four-month timeline? So um, the projections are uh, a method of um, um, one method of uh, looking at what might happen. So again, these are not exact numbers, but they're in the right kind of ballpark, whether it's 3,800 or, or, you know, just close to that on May the 5th, I think it was. Um, it was actually extremely close, and there's a ballparking of the, uh, the deaths. So what I think uh, is happening is that the epidemic is actually still slowing down. So the number of new cases, yes, we will see the numbers being reported, but the daily increase continues to go down. Um, so it has been at about 3 percent. Uh, daily increase, and that continues in this uh, sort of slowing trajectory. And we know that the doubling time has is, is now probably around 20 days. So the epidemic itself is de decelerating. But unfortunately and tragically, what's happening right now is that those who have been infected, of course, 
um, uh, uh, coming to the end of the clinical outcome. And uh, with so many long-term care facilities affected, um, I think that um, the number of deaths will continue to increase. And so the death, uh, in, in terms of the number of deaths and the projections are very much, I think, dependent on some of the measures that are being put in place to prevent serious outcomes in those high-risk uh, populations. So um, those projections will have to be adjusted again. So if there's more long-term care facility outbreaks, that is where the energy uh, should be put in, uh, in terms of uh, further increase in cases of deaths. Thank you, Doctor. Mike from Global, over to you. Oh. Oh, sorry. Very briefly, uh, and it's connected to uh, the answer that uh, Dr. Tam provided. We obviously uh, knew from the start that we needed to implement the Canada Emergency Response Benefit quickly in order to make sure that Canadians could stay healthy while being able to put food on the table. So 7.5 million Canadians have received uh, support from the CERB and will continue to be there for Canadians. Alors, euh, on savait dès le départ que la mise en place we de knew from the beginning that the CERB was going to be an essential measure. We wanted to ensure that Canadians could continue to remain healthy and follow the social distancing directives and keep washing their hands and all the other measures that, in many cases, was going to prevent them from going to work. So, uh, remain healthy while still being able to make ends meet. And we will continue to be there for Canadians. Merci, Mr. Minister. Mike. Thank you, Minister. Hello, Dr. Tan. Um, the Ontario Premier is calling for a national strategy on contract tracing. Is that feasible? And what would something like that look like? So I think um, that would. Um, well, contact tracing, first of all, is uh, absolutely critical piece of public health measure uh, as we go into the next um, phase or next steps of living with COVID-19. So it's a fundamental aspect of the public health response. And we know that uh, public health units are doing this. We want and, and if needed, uh, we can help with increasing contact tracing capacity. So that means trained people who can also do contact tracing. Um, that is already in place as the fundamental measure. But so how do we make it maybe even more effective and more efficient? Some of the discussions have been uh, about whether um, certain new technologies could help. I think that's the area where people are interested in looking at, well, is there some sort of um, additional layer of solution that we can look at across the board? Because if people keep use all different kind of tools, uh, then it will be more difficult. And some contacts, of course, may go in between provinces. So I think that's an a important area of discussion. So, so on technology, the Alberta Alberta's rolled out an app to do some contact tracing with. Is that something, something like that? Could that be used across the country? Well, I think um, different um, area, well, different um, solutions are being sort of piloted or put on the table. So I think what we want is to make sure we have, we know what's going on in every jurisdiction and learn what's you know, been happening, because I think if there are certain tools that are better than others, that's the kind of knowledge that you want to share. Not just whether the application works, but all the other policies that go with it, like privacy, and um, which I think is the most paramount of, of, of some of the policy uh, discussions. So all of those aspects are the kind of thing that we can help facilitate in terms of a discussion across the country. And then also to see if there's any t one tool that might be useful to everybody. So um, and, and uh, so though I think those are uh, actually quite active discussions right now. Thank you, doctor. Yes, uh, Sean Kilpatrick with the Canadian Press Photo Department. Uh, my question is for Tam, and it has to do with our immune systems. Um, what happens to our immune systems when we are isolated? Um, so the immune system is, is quite a complex system, and it's affected by many different, um, I think, uh, domains. I don't think it's necessarily been studied. We, we know that even the immune response to the virus itself is um, still needs to be 
uh, understood. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of other studies related to mental health and all sorts of other stresses and what that's that to do to the immune system. And I think that's worthy uh, of, of, of um, study and for people who are more expert in that area uh, to look at. But I absolutely agree that, you know, the immune system is a very complex thing and um, you need to maintain both physical and mental health. And that can be difficult to do if you are, um, you know, at home. Um, so um, all of that is some of the discussions right now um, in order to sort of restart and reopen things is, is, is that it's not just the effectiveness of the isolation or quarantine measures from a public health perspective, it's what are the potential negative impacts of, of those um, policies. So I think uh, that goes into the complex discussion locally on how do they safely restart. Is this a concern with children returning to school? So I think, um, as uh, I've said before, um, every local medical officer and chief medical officers uh, are looking at this very carefully. What we you have to start carefully and monitor what actually happens when kids go back to school. Um, and we what we do know is children um, and younger children in particular. Uh, have much milder illnesses, and um, it still remains to be studied in terms of how uh, infectious they are, uh, but there are some studies that suggest that they are not as infectious, which may mean that they've had less exposure to the virus, And but though that is actually uh, still need to be studied. In fact, um, you know, some of the most important questions, I think, uh, related to COVID-19 is the role of kids in uh, transmission. And then, just like with adults, we don't understand enough about the immune response uh, to the virus, uh, except that people do generate antibodies. And we have to see how uh, those antibodies might work and how long they last for. Thank you, Doctor. We'll just go back to the phone for three questions. Operator. The following question is from Hélène Bizetti, du Devoir. A vous la parole, please go ahead. Question. Minister Duclos, I'd like to come back to the CER, uh, CESB for students, the emergency benefit for students. The, there was a bill that was uh, adopted last week, but it was fairly vague, and many details weren't finalized and needed to be do, done so through regulations. Perhaps, for example, you might be able to keep more of the benefit even if you're working. So one week later, I'm wondering what, this, what about these details and what can you tell us about that? Answer, thank you for the question. It is an important part of our plan to help all Canadians. And that includes students. I taught for 25 years, and I know very well that the impact of such a crisis can have serious repercussions on, for example, the decision by students to, to pursue their studies or to abandon them for now. And, of course, it also depends on their ability to meet ends meet in the coming weeks. And they also need enough mon money to pursue their studies in the coming year. That's why very soon there will be more specific information provided, both by Minister Quattro and Minister Louboutier, as to this particular emergency benefit. Fo Follow-up question. So am I to understand that, yes, the original plan may be amended, and so these students, because especially for university students, the summer's, summer begins in May, usually, and when do we expect the first checks to be issued? Answer. Look, we are working at very rapidly on all of these measures, and very, very soon the further details will be announced on the same website on which where students can apply for the benefit. We expect this to take place smoothly and quickly, just as uh, it did with the CERB. It just only took a few days for people to be able to apply and receive their benefits, and this time it, that will be true for students, too. So we will very, very soon be announcing further details on that. Thank you, Minister. Operator, next question. Our, f our next question is from Laura Osman from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. I have the Good morning. 
I wanted to talk again about this inflammatory response um, that's being found in children. Uh, I understand there's no definitive link to COVID-19, but this news is, uh, you know, kind of freaky for parents, especially as they're considering sending their kids back to school as provinces start to look at that prospect. So what is your message to them if they're concerned that their kids be, may be more susceptible to COVID-19 than they thought? So we do know that um, the illness uh, in children, uh, milder, I mean, that's been observed across um, international studies. And so, um, so clinically, they have a much less severe outcome. That's not to say that rarely some, um, some more severe outcomes could occur, but that's, that's basically what uh, the, the scientific uh, data is telling us. Uh, but of course, if there's any concerns, uh, contact your health provider. Pediatricians um, are very aware of Kawasaki uh, disease because it actually happens in other viral illnesses and uh, infections as well. So it's not uh, specific to COVID-19, um, and uh, they will know how to manage that. And so I think, again, if there's any symptoms that parents are worried about. Uh, provinces are already, um, you know, as I said, widening the scope in terms of just sort of looking at the possibility of COVID-19 in people with all a whole range of symptoms. And so I think if there's any concerns at all, um, consult your health provider. But the bottom line is that we know that overall kids have much milder illnesses. Follow up. Thanks, Dr. Tam. I also wanted to ask about whether any progress has been made on gathering more detailed data about people suffering from COVID-19, like their race, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status, in sort of a centralized way. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think there's um, a number of um, gaps in that data, and um, I think at the national level, that is um, something that um, is you know, there's an effort in order to try and address that. Yes, yeah, Dr. New, I can just maybe add to that that certainly that uh, at the technical level, our staff are having active discussion with their counterparts in the provinces and territories in terms of uh, looking at uh, those types of issues and seeing what's within the art of the possible. Uh, certainly, everyone is uh, seized with uh, getting you know da data in a timely fashion, and obviously, uh, everyone like you know the more variables or more data we have, it's great. But uh, certainly, at this time, it's, uh, it's always a balance between uh, you know what's feasible. Everyone's uh, stretched uh, in terms of working, uh, uh, you know, under extreme uh, circumstances, and so it's, it's determining what are the uh, key items or key uh, pieces of data that we would like to collect, uh, I think, at a national level from each of the provinces and territories, and certainly that needs that sort of a collaboration agreement uh, between the provinces, territories, and ourselves. But those uh, discussions are active and ongoing. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Operator. Next question, please. <coughs> la prochaine question est de Émilie Bergeron de l'agence QMI. À vous la parole. Please go ahead. Hello, my question is for Minister Duclos. I'd like to come back to the uh, military assistance uh, being sent to uh, long-term care institutions. You mentioned seven others. Are we talking about the ones in, still in the region Montre in the Montreal area? Can you tell us more details about which institutions are being targeted? Answer. Thank you for the thank you for the question. I don't have the details yet as to the other seven institutions. This is a target that has been decided upon an agreement between the Canadian government, the Canadian Armed Forces, and the Quebec government. So, as I said, efforts so far have been targeting 13 main long-term care institutions, but seven others have been identified, and I believe this information will soon be available and will be provided by, at the same time by the Canadian Armed Forces and the Quebec government. Follow-up question? When it comes to the wage subsidy, a week or two ago, you said that the first uh, the, the first amounts would be provided to, on May 7th, which is tomorrow. Is that still the case? And how many, how much money do you expect to be sending out tomorrow? 
If so, also, are you considering broadening the scope of the uh, wage subsidy? Thank you. 110,000 uh, businesses had asked for to be reimbursed for the, the, through this wage subsidy so they could pay their workers from a retroactively from March 15th to April 11th. We expect about 90% of those applications to have already been pro processed. Which means that as of tomorrow, we also expect most of those businesses to re receive in their accounts the reimbursements for these wages that they paid their employees over the last weeks. About 10 percent of the businesses need to provide us with more information, or to uh, CRA, rather. The agency has already been in touch with those businesses as to the future evolutions of this important program to subsidize workers' wages. Well, of course, there is still much work to be done, and we uh, must keep consulting to ensure that, that our uh, country's economic strength can be maintained so that the economic recovery can take place as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Minister. One last question in the room. Hello, Mr. Minister Zuclo. I'd like to come back to the issue of seniors. Do you recognize that seniors' purchasing ability has diminished during the crisis because they are on fixed income often? And if so, have you been able to quantify or measure that loss of purchasing power? Answer, thank you very much. Well, our seniors were affected in many different ways by this crisis, of course, and we're quite concerned as to uh, by, about this, uh, this group that's been disproportionately affected. And the price of food has gone up, of course, which is another concern because of supply chain problems and transportation issues that we've seen over the last weeks. There's also the fact that many of these seniors are less mobile. In Quebec yesterday, we saw that some restrictions had been eased so that they could go pick up their groceries themselves because uh, there are because delivery fees may have increased lately. And so, but Statistics Canada has not yet studied the exact nature in the, of all the all the increased costs. But the increased costs are are there. We know, and that's why Prime Minister Trudeau recently said, and it okay. will soon be announced. Uh, we are going to pull away from this federal briefing today, uh, but wanted to end on that note because we do know that help for seniors, additional support for seniors is coming in the coming days, according to the Prime Minister. Uh, I want to wrap up a lot of what was said there with my colleagues in a moment uh, because there was some new information, some interesting things there. But first, I want to turn to New Brunswick because it recorded its first case of COVID-19 in more than two weeks yesterday. Dr. Jennifer Russell is that province's chief medical officer of health, and she joins me from Fredericton. Good to see you, doctor. Hello there. So everyone was uh, very envious of, of what you had managed to do in New Brunswick, flattening the curve, and then you had one case after two weeks of no cases yesterday. Do you know what happened? Well, this was to be expected. Obviously, in a pandemic where we have COVID-19 cases in all the jurisdictions surrounding New Brunswick, with the exception of PEI. Uh, this was not a surprise. This was expected. And so, you know, having zero cases was lovely. We really enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and also, you know, again, having everybody have recovered and nobody in the hospital and no deaths, that was obviously a wonderful success. But the long-term success involves living with COVID-19 in a way where we can uh, mitigate the, the issues around hospitalizations, utilization and, and ICU beds and have the economy running and have people protected in terms of the knowledge and, and the understanding of what they need to do individually to protect themselves from COVID-19. Sure. I guess this is one of those examples, though, where contact tracing that Dr. Tam was just talking about in that press conference becomes so critical to uh, controlling spread. Of course, absolutely. And, and, and when we look at opening up the economy, the things that really have to be in place and very, very uh, strong uh, things that need to be in place would be the contact tracing, the testing capabilities, uh, making sure that we are 
able to respond to outbreaks, uh, making sure that, again, the hospital facilities are available, the hospital beds and the ICU beds are available. So there are many, many things that have to be in place as we look at gradually opening up uh, society and the economy for, for us to succeed in the long term. This was community transmission, I imagine, because there's been no travel. Uh, well, our borders are still somewhat open in the sense that we are allowing essential travel to happen. So land borders and uh, at the airports, uh, we some people do get turned away. Uh, so if they don't have legitimate need to be in the province, they do get turned away. So, so we can continue to see travel-related cases. So we have two new cases. The one yesterday, uh, we still haven't determined if it's community transmission or not. So, it's um, uh, that one is not is still being investigated. Uh, but the latest one we know is travel related. Okay, so now you're up to two. Uh, I, I know that the premier has talked uh, w with my colleague Vashi and others about really keeping the border closed to people coming in who want to hang out in New Brunswick over the summer. How important is that going to be from a public health perspective uh, to really keep visitors away uh, at a time when you would normally expect them? Exactly, it's a balance. So again, we, we want to be able to have society function and the economy function as safely as we can while again we protect the population from having too many cases of COVID-19 at once and having our hospital system overwhelmed so so it is a balance but obviously we know that if we don't have community transmission then we know that the, the cases will be travel related and so limiting travel will be very important and the travelers that do come in have to self-isolate for 14 days. What what uh, what is your message to people right now? I know you know because we're all doing this at different speeds. Um, I would say even people in provinces like Ontario are sort of starting to relax a little bit, even though they're not really supposed to. And I wonder if you have encountered that too in New Brunswick, and and what your message is to people moving forward as you get into this sort of next phase of, as you say, living with COVID nineteen. Well, I think it's about setting expectations. So if the public understands and, and is able to internalize the fact that we are going to be living with COVID-19 for 18 to 24 months until there's a vaccine. So we're, we're pretty much past mile one of a 26 mile marathon. So get some water, get some Gatorade, get a power gel, and then we have to keep going. Uh -huh. And it's a long way to the end. And so we do have to stay vigilant. We do have to have to persevere. And, and be very resilient and adaptable as we go through this process. So there's lots of learnings, there's lots of new pieces of information that we get every day, and incorporating that into our plans as we move forward has to be very, very important. But certainly, nobody should be complacent at this point in time. Uh, okay, so two new cases in New Brunswick after two weeks of none. I will say uh, the rest of the country is still envious of that, uh, Dr. Russell, so you're doing something right. Thank you for making the time, appreciate it. Thank you very much. We're, we are very proud of what we've accomplished here so Good. far. Good, as you should be. Dr. Jennifer Russell, New Brunswick's Chief Medical Officer of Health. Thank you. All right, let me bring back my colleagues, Vashi Capellas, the host of Power and Politics, and uh, CBC's David Cochran. Uh, we'll go back to the briefing there. Uh, I didn't want to make New Brunswick feel bad that they now have two cases, um, but they are they are doing some remarkable things, and there are other provinces I know that are, are doing well as, as well. Uh, a few things stood out for me in that briefing. Uh, one was around the military issue. Uh, uh, because there are uh, expected to be a thousand soldiers now heading into long-term care centers in Ontario and Quebec and that is a staggering uh, bit of information because of what we're seeing inside those centers Vashi. Yeah, that definitely stood out to me, and that kind of joins up with something else that Dr. Tam said around, I think, a number of questions a lot of us have. All we, of course, the, the models that the federal government put forward are not crystal balls, and everyone who's presenting them have, be, have been explicit about it. But it does specifically look, when it comes to the number of deaths in this country, like some of the projections are being exceeded. And obviously that depends on where you live, but overall, uh, it looks like at least the, the number of de deaths that were projected are being met, if, n if not exceeded. And, and it was interesting to hear the explanation from Dr. Tam about that, specifically that, I, I would note this, the double time for the rate of infection mm -hmm. has, has gone to 20 days. It was at three days about a month ago and then at 16 days at the point at the time they were releasing the last set of federal models. It's now at 20 days and basically she said this is the epidemic is decelerating but we are at the sort of end of many of those who contracted the virus are at the end of the clinical outcome and right. that is particularly significant in long-term care homes and as a result we are seeing sort of an uptick in the number of deaths but that's not necessarily reflective of the 
the overall curve yeah. of the pandemic at this moment. I yeah. mean, a thousand soldiers in long-term care homes, I think underscores what you have been talking about so often on this special, that these long-term care homes are the epicenter of the virus in this country. 85% of the deaths in Quebec have occurred in long-term care homes, 79% of the deaths right across the country. Again, I'd point towards the conversation around essential workers in those homes, uh, whether there will be an agreement with the federal government. The feds are promising to top up wages for those who make less than $2,500 a month. My understanding is there could be an agreement in the coming days, but it might not be exactly what every province wanted. So mm -hmm. I've got my eye on that for sure. Okay, and, and just to give people a sense of where those um, soldiers are going, and David, no, I won't say everything, I promise. Uh, they're going into, they're in 13 long-term care centers, yep. uh, mostly in Montreal right now, five in Ontario, and headed into seven others. I mean, it, it, it again, again, we've talked about it time and time again, but it does highlight how this uh, pandemic is hitting parts of the population very differently, David. Yeah, two things, like the, the modeling uh, projections of a death rate, again, is not a projection or a prediction, it's a range of things and it also that's applied across a broad general population what we that's have right. is an epidemic in a very specific population that is acutely vulnerable to this and this is why the soldiers are in there and I understand Quebec has expressed some frustration on the pace of getting the soldiers in it was easy to get the first wave in because it was primarily uh, army doctors and nurses and medics who could go in and they are trained to deal with specific medical situations your rank-and-file soldier though highly trained is not necessarily trained to work in a long-term care environment in the middle of of a pandemic. They have field training in terms of medical emergencies and battlefield uh, uh, med medical training, but dealing with a virus is a completely different thing than dealing with a casualty in the field. Um, and part of the challenge too, Rosie, when you look at the Montreal situation, the finding is that because people are getting sick and coming out, the medical staff are getting sick and coming mm -hmm. out of long-term mm -hmm. care homes and coming out of hospitals, they're pulling from hospital A to help hospital B and then sending them back to hospital yeah. A and moving them into long-term care homes. The medical staff moving around are themselves becoming vectors of transmission. They are carrying or they have helped spread the disease unintentionally by contracting it in one home and bringing it to another, which is why in British Columbia they stopped the practice of people working in multiple homes. But we've heard, you know, that people in multiple hospitals, people in multiple facilities has actually helped spread and carry the virus through uh, parts of Montreal, the greater Montreal area. All the more reason to make sure that the soldiers we are sending in are trained to deal with this properly so they do not become vectors of transmission. Yeah, and I should say that Montreal is uh, really in, in, in quite a dire place right now because uh, the hospital capacity is quickly melting yeah. away, which is one of the, uh, the statistics that the Premier there had pointed to as a reason for allowing the loosening of public health restrictions. They are now even moving towards, uh, David and I were talking about this earlier, shipping people from hospitals in Montreal to other regions of the province to deal with that capacity issue. And there is a field hospital that had been prepared that will now likely even be used in Montreal. So again, a different picture uh, it, depending on where you are in the country as we know so well. But to end on a, on a good note, I'll just remind you what Vashi said earlier. The cases are doubling now every 20 days, which shows that things are moving in the right direction. Okay, uh, we will leave you now with our coverage. Thank you, Vashi. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Of course, our coverage will continue here on CBC News Network of this story and the repatriation of Canada's soldiers coming up at 2 o'clock Eastern. I'm Rosemary Thanks for watching.